Rich was asking if those who have gone on to heaven, believers who have died and are no longer with us here in this earthly realm in spirit, are they watching us from afar? You hear about, uh, you know, our parents who are watching from beyond, or in this case, Rich's dad, uh, seeing uh, all of the work that he's doing in his home improvement projects. Does his dad, who is in heaven and with God, see what he's doing or is he aware of what he's doing? Here's the context. Scripture does not say that those that have gone before us uh, are watching us all the time. That comes from a passage in Hebrews 12, uh, among other things that we'll address, but, but primarily where it says, since we have such a great crowd of witnesses, a uh, cloud of witnesses, um, uh, let us live a certain way. So when uh, in Hebrews 11, the writer is detailing all of these uh, people throughout scripture and some that we don't even know of who have lived by faith in the righteousness that only God can provide. So in the midst of their sinfulness, they depended upon God and God proved himself worthy of their trust and gave them a righteousness, uh, not of themselves, but of God. And so his faithfulness to them based on their trust in him whom they do not see and a trust of a righteousness that they cannot produce. And so in light of such a great cloud of witnesses, he says, because we have so many people who are witnesses for us, uh, shouldn't we throw off the sin that entangles and fix our eyes on Jesus and run the race set before us? So he lays out, we should live this way because we have a such we have such a great crowd, uh, cloud of witnesses. I can't say that very well today. There's a misunderstanding there. When he says we have a great cloud of witnesses, the word for witnesses, it doesn't mean that they are witnessing us. Since you have so many people gather around you that know the faithfulness of God who are watching everything that you're doing, that's not what it's saying. It's not saying that we have people witnessing us. The word witness there is martyr. It, it says, I am a testimony. I can give testimony to something that God has done. I have lived for and given my life for uh, God or for cause, taken literally. So there's a wonderful um, reality that we have a crowd of people uh, uh, in heaven, a cloud of martyrs who have given their temporal life for God's eternal glory as a testimony to the faithfulness of God. It doesn't mean that they're witnessing us every moment of every day, that my, uh, I did my grandmom's funeral uh, year before last. I have a dear friend who has uh, lost her husband recently, who's on with us this morning. Uh, we have loved ones that are no longer with us. It doesn't mean that they're watching us because that can cut both ways, right? They would be you know, happy for us when we're doing great things and sad for us and grieving when we're not. And heaven is um, not a place where people are living for temporal things. They're not looking for you, hoping that you get it right today and don't get it wrong tomorrow and hope you're doing well now because you weren't doing well yesterday. Look, the people that have gone before us are living in eternity. They're not living through the same chronology that we're living through. They are with God who knows and living in uh, God, in eternity, in eternal life, who knows the beginning from the end. Now, there's some things we don't know. Are they aware of what's happening on the earth or and seeing how everything is reconciled beginning from the end the end from the beginning just as christ does i think god is a happy god i think christ is happy with what he has accomplished eternally in the temporal in our timeline so i think they can see and know the beginning from the end whether they're experiencing everything at once and are outside of time or while we are still here they're going through a timeline and there was a time when they entered into heaven and there's a time when we're going to join them in their own experience and then there's going to be a wedding feast where we're celebrating our union with christ once we're all together again but whether there's a timeline and then we're all going to come back you know at some point in that timeline for the redemption of the church that remains here, whether there's a timeline in that chronology or we're all existing in a constant now, 
even while the earth still exists? There's a lot of debate about that because scripture isn't clear. And so here's what I want to say about that. I have really strong opinions about the chronology of people. And there are dear, brilliant friends of mine who have a different perspective of what that experience is like. They would say, in fact, my friend Ken Chalice that some of y'all know, we're going to be at Network 220 uh, together next weekend. He's uh, one of the keynote speakers next week, and I'm doing a, a workshop and uh, a Maybe next year, the following year, and in years past, we've swapped those roles. But one of my fellow board members, Tim, would say they can't know what's going on here because there's no crying. They're not in our timeline. They, uh, that they're they're not sad about anything. If they knew what was going on here, they'd be sad for us. They'd be sad about what's happening on the earth. Well, I don't think God is sad about it, and I think because He knows the end from the beginning. And I think he is not unaware of what's happening in our circumstances. So there's clearly a way that we can be in eternity and not sad about what's happening in temporal life uh, because you can know the end from the beginning and how everything is reconciled to the glorious, wonderful uh, grace uh, in the glorious, wonderful grace of God. So knowing Christ is to know that things can be reconciled now by faith and to be in eternity could mean that we... uh, not just know that it will be reconciled by faith, we're trusting that it'll be reconciled, but can know how it's going to be reconciled, can see its reconciliation. So in the moment that we're in sin and in struggle and in pain, they see the glory that God's going to bring about from it. Uh, so, and, and how we're going to be redeemed from it and how we're going to experience union increasingly by it. So whether or not uh, those that have gone before us are unaware of the crises that we're in so that there can be no crying, or they, with God and in Christ in their eternal state, know the end from the beginning and are not confused about how all things work for God's good, then they can be happy about God's good even in our temporal crisis. I don't know which of those are true. Uh, and it could be a third option that I can't think of because scripture is not clear. So let me tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to speculate about how these things work out in eternity and call it truth. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that with anything biblical. We're not going to look at things that we know to be true in scripture, make assumptions about what else might be true, and then call our assumptions truth. That's speculation and lofty ideas that we're raising up against what we know to be true of God, which is exactly the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing with his uh, uh, truth. So um, does that make sense? We're not, we're, we can speculate. There's nothing wrong with speculating, but we're not going to call speculation truth. And so where there's something that's, that scripture doesn't tell us, it means two things. One, it means that we cannot know for sure. Just because there's a way I can reconcile it doesn't mean that's how God reconciles it. And often my reconciling an idea of scripture brings about a conflict with something else in scripture. And that's how heresy happens. That's why people say, well, God loves us so much. No one could ever end up in hell. So I'm not going to believe anything in scripture about hell. We must be interpreting it wrong because it doesn't make sense that God could love us and there be a hell. Okay, now you're speculating because that's not what scripture says. It's okay to speculate, but don't call it truth. And where our speculation is in conflict with something else in scripture, let's just assume you can't know, or at least don't have the wisdom to reconcile it better than you are, uh, because nothing that God gives us that is true is in conflict with anything else that God gives us that's true. And just because you can't understand it, my uh, uh, fellow teachers who happen to take things speculatively and assume that you're always right because you're used to being right and knowing more than the people that are around you. You can't turn your speculation of interpretation of scripture, turn it into truth if it's in conflict with other things that are in scripture. And I, I, I draw...